All right, you can be seated for just a moment. Open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to walk through this fourth chapter. The first 14 verses of chapter 4 is what I want to do. Y'all just follow me. Can y'all follow me? Tell your neighbor, just follow me. Now, I'm going to give you my subject at the end of this because this is an abbreviated message. I want to talk about Nehemiah. Somebody say, Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah has the assignment of being the king's cupbearer. He has the job, the responsibility of drinking from the king's cup and eating from the king's plate before the king just in case it's poisoned he would die and the king would not drink or eat how many y'all want that job who's applying who's putting in the application i'm not putting in for that job but that's his job but one day while he's off serving this king in a in a country where he is not from he gets word that back in his homeland of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, that the city is in disarray. The people are distraught because the walls of the city have been destroyed, burnt down, and nobody has been able to repair these walls for hundreds of years. And he's distraught because the people who have returned to Jerusalem, they've come back to their hometown after having been dispersed. They've come back home, but there is a level of frustration and discomfort and insecurity because the walls have not been rebuilt. It's been hundreds of years since they've been torn down. So now this burden rests on Nehemiah's heart and this burden that he has is to go back and rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, he is so distraught about it that his boss, the king, sees his discomfort, his unhappiness, and asks him what's going on. And he tells the king, and the king releases him to go back to his homeland to work on the, on the walls. Not only does the king release him, he gives him money to make the trip. He gives him resources to rebuild the walls. So Nehemiah goes back to rebuild the walls. Some of you are like Nehemiah in your life. In your life, you have an assignment. God has a job. God has a mission for your life. God has an assignment for you. He's got something he wants you to do. And we learn from the story of Nehemiah some lessons that we have to take into consideration whenever we have an assignment from God. Look at the person sitting next to you. I know they look however they look, but however they look, they have an assignment. Look at them. Say, you have an assignment from God. There is something that God has put on the plate for you to do. There's a reason he created you. There's a reason you were birthed. You didn't just get birthed so you could go back and forth to work and do the same humdrum, boring job that you're doing every day. There's an assignment. There's a gift. There are deposits God has put down inside of you, and he wants you to fulfill it. But what happens? How do you, how do you handle it? Nehemiah has this assignment, and right off the bat, we see some things that we can learn from Nehemiah. I want to read beginning at verse 1 of chapter 4. Y'all with me? Chapter 4 verse 1 says, But it so happened when Samballot heard that we were rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. Samballot heard when he heard that they were rebuilding the wall. He heard that Nehemiah and the people of the Jews, the, the Jews were rebuilding the walls. He became very indignant and mocked the Jews. You need to be clear about this. When you are doing what it is God has called you to do, there's going to be people who are not going to like what you're doing. Let me thank the five people for the amen and the other three that clapped their hands. You need to get that in your spirit. Understand that, that there's always going to be somebody who's got something to say. Matter of fact, in verse 2 it says, He spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burnt? They looked at what Nehemiah and the people were doing and he ridiculed them. He, he mocked them. Matter of fact, he said, he, he looked, this is key point, he looked at what was out there. He looked at the remains of the walls that had been burnt down and there were heaps of rubbish, stones that had been burned, and he said they cannot possibly rebuild that. And I need to talk about that because there are some things in your life that God wants to rebuild. As a matter of fact, God wants to rebuild some stuff in your life, some stuff in your marriage, some stuff with your kids, some stuff in your family, some stuff in your finances. He wants to rebuild it. And when God wants to rebuild it and you begin to work the process to rebuild it, be clear that there are going to be people who are not going to be happy about what you're seeking to do. 
Here's what I discovered. I discovered this in the course of my life, in the course of my journey, in my 40 plus years of preaching. I discovered that anytime I'm headed in the direction to do what God wants me to do, there's always going to be opposition. As a matter of fact, saints, opposition is an indication that you're headed in the right direction. If you're not getting opposition, perhaps you need to reevaluate which direction you're going in. Because I am assured and I'm positive that the devil will do everything he can to discourage you and to slow you down and to make you want to quit or turn around and go in a different direction anytime you're doing what it is God wants you to do. Not only are they, is the devil going to try to stop you, people, God raises up people who talk about you, who reject you. Matter of fact, in chapter, in, uh, in verse 3, in verse 3 of chapter 4, it says, Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. If a little fox rubs up against it, it'll break the whole wall down. In other words, what they're doing is not going to amount up to much. Some of you today have sought to do some things and people have ridiculed you, talked about you and said, it ain't going to amount up to much. I discovered that what may not be much to people, God can take it and blow it up and make something significant out of it. So he has these people who, have, who are talking about him and rejecting him and in verse, and these are outside people. Somebody say outside people. You're going to get outside opposition, expect it, anticipate it, look forward for it to come. Matter, as a matter of fact, you're not doing, matter of fact, as a matter of fact, the closer I get to the things that God has destined for me to do is the indication that I get when I get all the opposition that I know I must be getting close to what God has for me to do. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but somebody better get that in your spirit and understand the devil wants to discourage you. So in verse 4 and 5, Nehemiah responds to their criticism and responds to their anger and their furious, their fury and their indignation and their bad words. He responds in verses 4 and 5 by praying. Oh, he says in verse 4, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. You got to learn to pray for people that don't like you. So verse 6 says, so we built the wall. We built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. I love that verse. They built the wall, the entire wall. They had joined the wall up together. It was half its height. The people had a mind to work. But look at verse 7. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites, the Mosquito Bites, the Termites heard <laughs> that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored. Everybody come up against you when you're trying to do God's will. When they heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the, the gaps were beginning to be closed, they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. They made a plan to come and work together to destroy the work of Nehemiah. Nevertheless, verse 9, we made our prayer to our God. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, you got to learn to pray to God. And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, now, now, now get this picture now, up till verse 9, we've got opposition coming from outsiders. But when we get to verse 10, something else happens. Then Judah said, now Judah is one of the 12 tribes. Matter of fact, Judah is the tribe of praise. Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. Judah, the people who should be leading the battle, praising the Lord. Judah, one of the 12 tribes who should be joined in celebrating, start complaining. Here's what they say, the peoples is tired. The strength of the laborers is failing and there's so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. There's so much stuff, there's so much damage. Some of you have looked at your circumstances and you're talking like Judah did. Instead of praising God with hope and anticipation, Judah is complaining and saying, I, I hate this right here. Judah says, it's too much rubbish. Some of you today have stopped even trying to rebuild the walls of your life. This is our year of restoration and God wants you to restore the things in your family and the things in your life. He wants to restore your finances, your home, your job, your career, your name. But you said there's too much rubbish. 
My marriage has gone through too much. My children have gone to, done too much. The finances are so bad, it's too bad. The rubbish is gone. You have made the conclusion there's no need in trying. Here's what I'm here to tell somebody today. Maybe you're the only person in the other thousand, two thousand people, I don't know how many of y'all are here, but everybody else got to sit through this message because of you. And here's what it is, and I need you to get it because you made everybody else come through the ice and the snow to come here, and it's for you. You're going to have opposition outside, and you're going to have opposition inside. You're going to have people against you who are not close to you, and you're going to have people against you who are close to you. You're going to have people who don't know you talking about you, and you're going to have people who should be encouraging you and praying with you and walking with you who can't see what you see. Nehemiah saw that he had the ability to rebuild the walls, but everybody didn't stand with Nehemiah. That's why I appreciate this man. I value him. He's a, he's, a, he's a role model for us because he shows us you can do something. And in spite of what he was facing and seeing, he went on. And here he is faced with outside distractions and inside distractions. In verse 11, he says, and our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was, verse 12. When the Jews who dwelt near them came, that they told us ten times, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Everybody's against them. Nehemiah seems to be the only one with the faith and the hope to believe that God can be able to give them the victory. Verse 13, therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families and their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, and to the leaders, and to the rest of the people. I love this. Because in the midst of all of this opposition, in the midst of all of these people on the outside talking about them, in the midst of inside people talking against them, in, in the midst of Judah not praising God and finding all the fault, and all of the Jews coming and saying, Nehemiah, we don't have a chance. Nehemiah, in verse 14, I love it, he stood up, he looked, he arose, and he said to the nobles, and to the leaders, and to the rest of the jokers, do not be afraid. There's the first thing you got to do. You cannot be afraid. Somebody look at your neighbor. Wake the person up next to you. Say, don't be afraid. I want you to rock that person. Just hunch them on the side. Say, you need this point right here. Don't be afraid. Let me holler at you about this for just a second because the problem is some of you will never move forward because fear has kept you in grip. Fear has kept you down. Fear has kept you from doing anything, but my assignment is to try to preach and declare to you that you don't run away from the fear, you always run in the direction of your fears. I know some of y'all don't get that. You're trying to say what you're talking about, Pastor. What I'm trying to tell you is this. The scripture teaches with clarity that God has not given to us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. That means that wherever the fear is coming from, it did not come from God. It came from the devil. Look at your neighbor and say, fear always comes from the devil. Tell your neighbor, fear always comes from the devil. Look at your neighbor on the other side and say, fear always comes from the devil. Y'all are not saying it. Y'all don't have an attitude. I need you to have an attitude about it. Fear always comes from the devil. That's who the message is for right here. There it is right there. Somebody say it's always from the devil. Run in the direction of your fear. Don't run away from the rear. Run fear. Run toward the fear. Some of y'all are being afraid. God's got a future. God's got a destiny. God has an assignment. God's trying to take you someplace and you're going to have to overcome your fears to get there. You're going to have to run in the face of your fears. You're going to have to talk to your fears. You're going to have to run towards your fears. You're afraid to take that job because you're not qualified. Go ahead and apply for the job. God has the ability to equip you to do it. I know you ain't qualified. God knows you ain't qualified, but God loves to use people who are not qualified for the job. Run in the face of your fears. You're afraid to get married. Listen, you need to get married. Somebody say, Pastor, how you know whether you're supposed to get married? There's a good way to know. I can tell you easily how you know whether you're supposed to get married. Are you a eunuch? Y'all know what a eunuch is? Can you live a celibate life? If you can't live celibate, 
you need to get married. Look at your neighbor. Somebody on your road needs to get married. Oh, y'all done, y'all messing with me right now. Y'all can't handle this truth. I'm trying to tell you, you need to get married. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be afraid. Some people are not moving toward marriage because they're fearful. Why they're afraid? Because all their friends got divorced. Hey, just because other folk did something like that don't mean it has to happen for you. Run in the direction of your fears. Can I hear, do anybody understand what I'm saying? Run in the direction of your fears. If you're going to accomplish what God has for you, you're going to have to overcome fears. It must be for her. Somebody say amen. Ain't nobody else shouting. Ain't nobody else running. But I know it's for one person. I don't know who it is, but you're up in this camp somewhere. God's trying to move you forward. God's trying to get you to the next level, but you are afraid. Nehemiah said, do not be afraid. I'm prophesying to you today. Stop being afraid and get up and arise and go in the direction of your fears. On the other side of your fear is your destiny. On the other side of your fear is what God has for you. On the other side of your fear is your breakthrough, your miracle, what God wants to do in your life. Get on the other side. Don't let fear hold you back. I love Nehemiah. He said, do not be afraid. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be be scared. Go ahead, look at him. Say, don't be scared. Look at him. Tell him in their face. Roll your head. Don't be scared. I used to be afraid of heights. I couldn't go into a tall building and go over to the window because I'd get scared. So I went and learned how to fly a plane. That's how I took on my fears. Do not be afraid. Write that point down. But hold up. Y'all still in verse 14? The next part of the verse, he says, remember the Lord. Y'all missed a great spot to shout right there. Why should we be shouting, Pastor? Because Nehemiah was facing a task, listen here, that was impossible to complete. They had not been able to rebuild those walls in hundreds of years. He did the completion in 52 days. And he was able to do that because he remembered the Lord. Great and awesome, the scripture says. What what does that mean? That means when you are in the midst of doing something, you got to have the kind of courage and faith in the midst of your fears, and you got to remember that you have faced challenges in your past. You've had problems in your yesterday, and God brought you through it yesterday. And he, you know what? Here's what I believe. God allowed you to have trouble yesterday so that you could overcome it, so that when you face what you're facing today, you can remember from where God has already brought you from. Anybody here ever had God do something supernaturally for them in their life? Open a door, work a miracle, heal your body, answer a prayer, give you victory, defeat your enemy. Anybody here ever had God do something that you know nobody but God could have made that happen? It had to be the Lord. Only God could have made it happen. Somebody say, remember the Lord, remember the Lord. Remember, it was him that did it. It was him that made it work out. And if he did it back then, he's still the same God today. He's still working the same today. Now, I don't know who this word is for, but in 52 days, you're going to see something shifting in your life. the 52nd day something's going to change so I prophesy it I speak it I declare it in 52 days in 52 
52 days a miracle is going to come in 52 days a breakthrough is going to come out in 52 days what you've been praying for he's going to bring something to pass in 52 days I'm almost finished. I need you to get this. This is for your destiny. This is for the restoration. This is for the answer you've been waiting for. You done cried tears, you done wept and got frustrated. People done talked about you outside your family, inside your family, but they have no idea that you are on assignment from Almighty God. He has told you to do what you're doing. You are following his instructions. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what God has in store and prepared to do through you. I don't know who I'm preaching to but the last part of that verse so don't be afraid tell somebody don't be afraid listen listen carefully there are gonna be some opportunities coming your way do not be afraid God's gonna give you a word to do some things do not be afraid remember the Lord Tell your neighbor, remember the Lord. By the way, he's great and awesome. He done brought me through my past. Here's my third thing. He says in the text, fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. That's my subject, fight for your family. This is a fight for your family moment. This is a time for you to fight for that which you thought couldn't be made right. Fight for your family. How far somebody say he's telling you to fight for your family. I know it looks like it's in rubbish. I know it looks like it's been burnt. I know it looks like it doesn't stand a chance. I know so much drama has happened, but God told me to tell somebody, fight for your family. Fight for your husband. Fight for your wife. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for them. Fight. Fight for your nephew. Fight for your niece. Fight for your family. Fight for your family. The devil can't have them. I know your husband ain't bringing the money home, but fight for him. I know your wife ain't giving you none, but fight for her. Pray a prayer. Believe God for a miracle. Fight! I bind that devil of disbelief. I rebuke that demon that makes you doubt God. I command that devil to loose you and set you free. Believe God for a miracle. Believe God for a miracle. Believe God to restore your family. He's gonna turn that son around. He's gonna break the chains off that child. He's gonna take the taste of drugs out of their veins. He's gonna cause that young lady to come out of that shacking situation. Believe God, fight for your daughter. Fight for your son. Hallelujah. Fight, 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 fight. Matter of fact, if you keep on reading, listen, they kept on building the wall. In one hand, they had their hammer. In the other hand, they had their sword. One hand, a hammer, and another hand, the sword. One hand, keep doing the work that God has called you to do. In the other hand, have the weapons of your warfare. Keep on praying. Keep on fasting. Keep on reading that word. Keep on believing God. Have a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. Tell the devil, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I won't slow down. I will not stop. Who am I preaching to today? 
Let me see who I'm preaching to. Come here, come here, come here. Quickly, hurry up, come here. Hallelujah. Come believing. Come believing. Come believing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 52 days a breakthrough. 52 days a miracle. 50. It's spectacular. It shouldn't have happened, but God made it happen. Somebody say, God, tell somebody, tell your neighbor, God is going to make it happen. Tell them, God is going to make it happen. Wait, hold on. Listen, and it happened, verse 15, and it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing. That's what y'all need to know. Whatever plot the enemy has against you, God has brought it to nothing. The people on your job who try to get you fired, it's been brought to nothing. Somebody get excited about that. It's been brought to absolutely nothing. Don't be afraid. Say that, I can't be afraid, say it. Not afraid. There's gonna be some opportunities to come, I have to walk through that door. Can't be afraid to engage in whatever it is God wants you to do. You can't be afraid to obey his voice. Then he says, remember the Lord. I don't know your names, I don't know your history, your story, but what I do know is everybody in here has something that God did for you at some point in your life that you know it was God. And he gave you that success back then so that when you're facing where you are facing now, you wouldn't question God. You would say he's great and awesome because he did that back then. He can do something for me today. And the third thing he says is fight for your family. I'm sending some of you back to go fight for your family, fight for your marriage, fight for your spouse, your husband, your wife, your kids, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your relationship. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta fight. You gotta put your dukes up. I was, I was doing this at the eight o'clock service this morning. And Kenny Chavez, one of our members, he's a box, he's a box referee. He referees professional fights. He came up to me at the service. He said, Pastor, when you're boxing, you got to keep your hands up. <laughs> So you can't let you can't drop your hands. You got to keep your hands up. So you can't put your. You got to keep your hands up. Y'all missing me? You got to keep your hands up. Man. You got to keep on worshiping. You got to keep on praising. Now, you might not be as smooth. It's Muhammad Ali, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. You might not be that smooth. You might not be like a Floyd Mayweather. You might not be that smooth. You might have to fight like my sister Nisi. Somebody says, put your head down and just go to swinging. Just put your head down and go to swinging. <laughs> I just don't want you to lose faith let's pray Father in Jesus name scattered around this altar are your sons and daughters with their hands up and their hearts filled with faith 
God, we're dismissing off fear. We are eliminating all of that anxiety. And we're willing, God, to trust you and do whatever it is you tell us to do. And I'm praying right now, Father, in Jesus' name, that by the power of your spirit and the power of your anointing, that you give us the courage to say yes to your will. Help us, God. I'm praying right now that you would descend an angel, dispatch your angels, and bring the breakthrough within 52 days of what your sons and daughters are standing in need of. If it's a miracle in their family, a miracle with their finances, if it's a miracle with their marriage or a miracle with their kids, whatever it is, God, restore and rebuild is our prayer. It's our humble request that it will be accomplished and done, God, just like you did it for Nehemiah. Do it for these, your sons and daughters. Father, I believe you've already begun to dispatch the angels, and I give you thanks and praise for what you're going to do in their lives. We remember you, Lord. We know that you have all power in your hands. We know you can work it out. And we thank you. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Go ahead and give him a shout. Give him a praise. Thank him like you believe he's already worked it out. Praise him like you believe you already got it. Tell him, thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name. I count it as done. I think it's completed. I receive it, almighty God. I receive it in Jesus' name. Doors are opening. Miracles are happening. God is going to work it out. The thing that you thought could never be fixed, he's going to fix it. You thought it would never happen, it's going to happen. Hallelujah. By faith. I believe it done. I count it in Jesus' name.